morning. Will all those who are able please rise and join me in our call to worship? The reign of God is drawing near. Prepare the way for the Lord. Welcome one another, for Christ welcomes you. Join me in our invocation. Holy, Holy God, God, we long for your peace and trust in your promise. We hear your call to turn toward you. Meet us here and fill our minds with your wisdom and our hearts with your peace, that our worship together may open us to the challenge of your dream of wholesomeness for all. In the name of the one who is coming, we pray. Amen. John the Baptist called the people of Israel to repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As we prepare for the coming of Christ and his joyous kingdom, let us confess to God our sins so that God can help us set our lives in a new direction. O oh God, you call us to turn our lives around and work with patience and diligence to prepare the way for your reign but we get discouraged and give up too soon. Holy One, have mercy. O God, you call us to collaborate in unity, to prepare the way for your reign, but we can trust and honor the gifts of others. Christ, have mercy. O God, you call us to be full of joyful confidence, to prepare the way for your reign, but we burden ourselves with anxiety and Holy One, have mercy. Forgive us, God, and lead us in the ways of patience, community, and joy. 
Hear the good news. Jesus, Savior from sin, is present with us in the painstaking work of the reign of God, forgiving our weakness, rebuilding our relationships, restoring our joy. Amen. in our world are under siege with information, television and telemarketing, blogs and texting. So much information often bearing too little wisdom. Angry voices compelling hate. Quiet voices counseling compla complacency. Mechan mechanical voices offering deals. Too much information. Too much wisdom. Fusion surrounds us Truth gets lost. We call out in our confusion. Where is your wisdom, O oh God? Where is the world that leads to life? We remind ourselves of our ancient story. John, Zachariah's son, out in the desert at the time, received a message from God. He went all through the country around the Jordan River preaching a baptism of life change leading to the forgiveness of sins, as described in the words of Isaiah the prophet. Prepare God's arrival. Make God's road smooth and straight. Let us light this second candle of Advent, a candle of peace. In its light, let us think quietly and peacefully about what voices of true life change and forgiveness are speaking in our world right now. Let this candle of Advent peace shine in our hearts all week and remind us to enter time of quiet and peace in order to listen through the noises of our lives for the calling to prepare for the Holy One. Thank bits and pieces for uh, lighting our Advent candle and now I would like the children to come forward for a children's sermon. Well, it's good to see all of you here. I'm Pastor Jim, Pastor Paul, because he's, he was out for the birth of his grandchild uh, just last night. But it's good to be with all of you. And I wanted to talk with you a little bit about one of the stories that, that we're going to hear just in, in a few minutes. It's from the Old Testament. That one of the prophets talks about what we call the peaceable kingdom. I brought a, a picture here that kind of illustrates that. It says, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, and a little child will lead them. So we have here the leopard, we have a goat, the goat's got the horns, uh, the wolf, the lamb, and the child. And actually the child is all, all of us. And this is, yeah, this is from the 11th chapter of the prophet Isaiah. And it's kind of a vision, it's something that, that we're, that, that God gave to Isaiah, it's, it's, it's a, like a goal or it's something we, we as, as God's people want to work with. And, and he uses, I'll use a big word here, a metaphor, a metaphor of, of the animals getting along. And we know normally, you know, leopards and wolves don't get along with lambs. That's, uh, that, that doesn't happen. But in God's kingdom, in that kind of future that we're striving for, that's what's going to happen. I, I, I meant to bring my friend Eikhoff with me today. Eikhoff is, is a squirrel who I uh, met when I was in Germany. And he takes care of my house in, in Covington. 
and I, I forgot, he, I left him on the table. He's a good friend. You know, squirrels normally wouldn't get along with uh, leopards and wolves uh, very well either. But Eikhoff is part of that, uh, that kingdom as well. And, and we're part of it. it. It says the child will lead them. And again, that's, that's all you, that's all of us. We're all children of God. And, and we, we want to work for that time when all of us can, can get along. You know, there's, there's a lot of hate and a lot of war. And people kill each other. Uh, and as, as Christians and as the church, we, we want to we want to make that better. We, we want to work toward toward something else. So, I forgot. To, I, I was going to go in Paul's office and bring out his candy. I, I I forgot to do that today. So I apologize. You have to talk to talk to Pastor Paul when he when he comes back. Uh, we hear. Well, you guys are doing you're doing the program next Sunday. So, so uh, anyway. So let's have a prayer, and then I'll send you back to Miss Tammy. God, we thank you for these children. They're special to us. We ask that you bless them, watch over them, love them. Lord, help all, all of us to be your children and to lead, lead the world into that peaceable kingdom that, that you, you described for us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a good day, and we'll look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Okay, I'll give you, give you back to Miss Tammy. <laughs> Thanks for coming up. I don't get to do that very often, so uh, I, maybe I'm not very polished at that, but it's, it's, uh, it, it's fun. It's, it's fun to be, and, and I remember back in my home church, I, I remember being one of those kids sitting on the uh, steps with uh, Pastor Gant, so, so I, I remember that time. I, I would invite, uh, as we come to our time of prayer, invite you, if you have uh, prayer concerns, to uh, write those down and pass those to the center aisle. Let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Creating and sustaining God, in your presence there is life. Living water springs up and deserts bloom where you pass. Seeking the life that comes from you, we have gathered before you. Our hearts are ready, O oh God, our hearts are ready. Delight us with your presence and prepare us for your service in the world. This we pray through the grace of Jesus Christ. O God of peace, Emmanuel, send your light into our hearts. Help us to be ready for the day and the hour of Christ's appearing. Work in our hearts to prepare us for the peace that Jesus brings. The inner peace that tells us that we are united with you and the outer peace which will come when he returns to judge the world. Bless our worship that it may be pleasing unto you and bless us that we may prove to be your faithful servants. Lord Jesus, master of both the light and the darkness, send your Holy Spirit upon our preparations for Christmas. We who have so much to do seek quiet spaces to hear your voice each day. We who are anxious over many things look forward to your coming among us. We who are blessed in so many ways long for the complete joy of your kingdom. We whose hearts are heavy seek the joy of your presence. We are your people walking in darkness yet seeking the light. To you we say, come, Lord Jesus. God, we pray for our sisters and brothers in other churches in this area. We pray for St. John, UCC, and Harrison, for them and their searching for pastor. 
pray for the ministry at First UCC and their pastor, Dan Wayne Geis. We pray for Truth and Destiny Covenant Ministries and their pastor, Leslie Jones. Send your spirit upon them, O Lord. Help them to minister boldly in your name and preach the word. We pray for Gloria Day Lutheran Church and their work in our community. We pray, O Lord, that with one voice we may glorify you, serve you, love you, and love each other. God, you've heard the, the prayer requests that we have mentioned, various concerns, joys, deepest sorrows, illness, separation, ordinary events, <coughs> lives of service. Lord, we offer all those to you. We feel overwhelmed when we, we hear the issues, the concerns, and yet we know that your love is so great that you, you can meet the needs. You hear the requests. You love all of your people. We thank you, Lord, for this time of prayer that we can come to you to give our souls before you, to bear our souls, to acknowledge our sins to receive your grace, to hear a word of forgiveness. We are grateful for this time, O oh Lord. Help us to listen for your word, listen for the answers of the prayers that we offer. Lord, now we come before you in a time of silent prayer, offering before you those things that we may not have mentioned, but those things that lie deep within our hearts and our souls, we offer them now to you. We would gather together these prayers along with the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, Choir, for a very beautiful anthem. We are so blessed to have a, a, a large and a very talented choir who shares their talents with us each Sunday and other occasions. As many of our churches have uh, become a lot, a lot smaller, uh, often that means they don't have a choir. So we are, we are blessed to have these folks uh, with us uh, every Sunday. And uh, let's, let's, let's give them a hand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our first scripture lesson comes from the prophet Isaiah, and it's that text that I was uh, referring to in, in the children's sermon. Familiar text for Advent about a shoot coming out from the stump of Jesse and that reference to God's peaceable kingdom from Isaiah, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 10. A shoot shall come out of the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt about his waist and faithfulness the belt about his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as an ensign to the peoples, the nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. Here ends the first lesson. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. The second lesson is from the Psalms. Psalm is, is a response to that Old Testament lesson. This is from Psalm 72, verses 1 through 7, and verses 18 through 19. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. May the mountains yield prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the needy, and crush the oppressor. May he live while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like the showers that water the earth. In his days may righteousness flourish and peace abound, until the moon is no more. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May his glory fill the whole earth. Amen and amen. I would invite those who are able to stand for the reading of the gospel. The reading comes from Matthew, the third chapter, verses 1 through 12. It's Matthew's recounting of the coming on the scene of John the Baptist. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. 
and the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him in all the region along the Jordan. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. In the chaff, he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Every year on the second Sunday of Advent, John the Baptist appears in the wilderness, but also in our hearts in our minds. The person of John the Baptist attracts immediate attention as a tough-minded, straightforward, no-nonsense preacher. John may have been like Alexander White, noted preacher at pre-St. George's Church in Edinburgh, Scotland. It was said that White could be so direct and penetrating that to hear him preach was to take your life in your hands. Whether they knew it or not, those who went out into the wilderness to hear John preach also were taking their life into their hands. John was a kind of a wild-looking character, dressed in the camel hair garment of the Bedouin people, kind of living off the land. He probably looked like our hippies from the 1960s. And you know, I, I think there's some, uh, some of my peers around here who probably... Uh, you know, it may have been hippies. May, may have had the long hair and the, you know, all, you know, all that went with that. John is as abrasively honest as he is unashamedly and crudely attired. He doesn't mince words. John the Baptist came preaching a message of repentance, radical change, radical turnaround in one's life. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now this story that we heard is not one of the birth narratives of Jesus because if we read further in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is 30 years old and he's about to begin his ministry. Jesus' preaching also will echo this call to repentance, a different way of believing and living. Now John the Baptist isn't in our nativity scenes, he's not in our Christmas songs, he is absent from our secular observances and celebrations of this month and season. He is a harsh figure with a harsh message, and honestly, one whose message is very difficult for most ministers to embrace. John was a prophet, and we know what happens to prophets. They're killed. John was arrested during Jesus' ministry. He was put in prison. He was beheaded, not simply executed, but beheaded, a, a horrible form of death and torture. John the Baptist calls us to repentance, to change our lives as we await the Lord's second coming. Historically, Advent was seen as a season of repentance for the church, much like the season of Lent. Church over the centuries has come to understand that Christians need to set aside times during the year to reflect on what the coming of Jesus Christ into our world and our lives means for us. Some churches hold special services during the season of Advent, much like we do during the season of Lent, in order to focus on these themes. 
But this call to repentance is largely absent in our secular Christmas celebrations. It's one of the themes of Advent that is radically different from our secular culture. At times, we in the church may seem like a voice crying in the wilderness. We, we hear those words from Isaiah. We may be that voice crying in the wilderness, speaking a different message from the dominant culture. Calling people to a season of repentance is a daunting task. But on a regular basis, on Sunday morning, we hear scripture readings and other admonitions calling us to confess our sins, calling us to repentance, to change. That confessing may be to one another. It may be a corporate prayer, such as what we offered this morning. It may be confession to a priest or a minister, or it may be a, a prayer to God, a prayer that we offer directly to God. Our text says that the people were confessing their sins as they were appearing there uh, with John. We have trouble doing that if we have to mention specific sins and especially if we have to be present with the person that we have offended. It's uncomfortable, it's hard to face up to our shortcomings, our mistakes, our conscious and unconscious sins and misconduct. John's message crossed the social barriers of his time for we are told that Sadducees and Pharisees, two of those major groups in leadership in Israel at that time, also came for baptism. Now there's some scholarship that hangs on the translation of, of a, I think it's a, of a, of a preposition that says that the Pharisees and Sadducees may have been coming to protest the baptism of John because baptism was usually something that they did within the confines of, of the temple leadership. Well, John knew in his heart what was going on and he had special words for them. Call them a, a bunch of snakes. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Thinking about snakes kind of slithering away from a fire. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say that we have Abraham as our ancestor. We can't rely on our heritage or social standing. We can't say, well, I'm a member of St. Peter and St. Paul United Church of Christ, as have been my parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. It accounts for nothing. We can't simply say we're sorry and we'll try to do better. We have to show evidence that we have changed our attitudes and our behaviors. John's sermon is a strong indictment of that brood of vipers, to use his words. John calls for integrity between our words and our actions through, through the, the mystery of the scriptures transmitted to us over 2,000 years. John is speaking to us as well. Before the searching word of God, neither ritual nor genealogy provides a valid claim for exemption from that wrath that is to come. One aspect of the Lord's Advent is this full revelation of the kind of persons that we are and the consequences of character and action. Think about the call of the prophet Isaiah in the sixth chapter of, of the book of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah is there in the temple and he is in the presence of God and immediately he says, woe is me for I am a person of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Simply being in God's presence reminded him in, in a startling way that he was a sinful person and he lived with other sinful persons. So that's, that's what we are called to experience, to experience that presence of God such that it does change our lives. If John the Baptist were, would appear today, where would he appear? What would he eat? What would he sound like? Well, I think he would appear
appear among the people, common people, ordinary people, people like us, maybe people living in the inner city, in poverty-stricken areas where industry and jobs have lost, or have left, where unemployment is high. He wouldn't be wearing a three-piece suit. He'd probably be wearing jeans and a sweatshirt, maybe t-shirt, sandals. What would he eat? Maybe uh, nuts and berries if he were in the, in the forest. Maybe at McDonald's. Maybe he'd be eating out of a McDonald's dumpster, getting whatever he could. What would he sound like? Loud. Loud, bellicose, like the old time revival preachers who didn't need a PA system. They could, they could fill the whole room and church with, with their voice. That is probably what John would sound like. I think he would say, You should look at what you spend on military security versus what you spend on food assistance, housing assistance, care for the elderly, and education. He would condemn the hateful and hurtful words that we have for each other and for people who are different from us. He would condemn our obsession with money and possessions and wealth and our lack of love for our neighbors and family and friends. I think he would condemn the divisiveness of our political campaigns. Who are the prophets who are among us today? I have to admit that, that when I asked myself that question in doing preparation, I had a hard time thinking of who are the prophets of today. I guess I thought a little more about prophets from the past, thought of uh, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., whose birthday we'll celebrate in January, one who, who was a prophet, who died largely because he was a prophet. I think of uh, Reverend Maurice McCracken, uh, a lot of us here in Greater Cincinnati remember him protesting in many places for what he felt was, was right and proper, uh, advocating for those who were poor, even when he was, he was in his 80s and the police would come and arrest him and maybe pick him up. Sometimes he was in a wheelchair and they wouldn't take him to jail because they, they knew that wouldn't do any good, wouldn't change what he was, would, would do. I think of uh, Reverend John Dorhar, who was the uh, president and general minister of the United Church of Christ. Uh, he was in the Cincinnati a, a couple of years ago. I think of his leadership of the church, his uh, pointing out to us uh, about our racial divisions that still persist. Uh, he, he's kind of made a point about talking about what's called white privilege, how, how those of us who are white still enjoy uh, a lot of advantages. Even we've, we've come a long way, we still have a long way to go. I think of a Pope Francis, who I think is a modern day prophet, speaking out for the poor, speaking against the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, he is a prophet, I believe. And who have been the John the Baptist in your own lives? I think of uh, two of my pastors uh, at my home church while I was growing up, uh, John Gant and Carl Verkuteren. Uh Both of them were right out of seminary when they came to Grace Church. So they were full of energy and enthusiasm and probably some naivete as all young people are, and yet they were very committed to uh, the traditional worship of the church, to pastoral care, to Christian education, to the nurture of God's people, and yet they were also very committed to the civil rights movement. Um, they were committed to the work of the church, the, the, the church doing good work in the community, do, working for Jesus Christ in, in positive ways. And they were both uh, role models for me. And even though I didn't know it at the time, they were my mentors 
for uh, what I would do in ministry later on. John the Baptist calls us to self-examination, difficult as that may be. We're called to examine our lives in the light of the teachings and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That call to change, it's difficult to hear, it takes disciplined behavior, and yet it enables a transition to a new life, it calls us to be a new people. That's how we prepare for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to turn in your bulletins to the affirmation of faith. And this is one that uh, Pastor Paul located for us. And I would invite those who are able to stand as we use these words to say together what we believe. As you see, it's from Reverend Stephen Ferry. It's on his website. Let us say together. We believe that God has come to us, that God brought us into being, that this God gave breath and purpose, that we have been blessed to be a blessing to others, that we have fallen short of this commandment, but that God has nevertheless loved us despite our brokenness. We believe that God is coming to us, that God is not happy to leave us alone, that this God will come to us as a particular human being, that God will be made known to us in flesh and bone like ours, that Mary will soon give birth, Joseph will soon clap his hands in joy, that Jesus Christ will be born and our salvation made complete. We believe that God will come to us, that God will have the final word, and that word will be good, that this God will give us the presence of the Spirit to continue our work, that we are called to be disciples to all the corners of the earth, that the day is coming when tears and pain will be no more, and that all will gather at the table to sing an endless and perfect hallelujah. Amen.
Please be seated. The ruler of peace is coming, the prophet Isaiah says, and we await that gift of God together. Our gifts today in this season of waiting and hope help us to strengthen one another and offer hope to the world as we look forward to that great day of everlasting joy. Let us gather our gifts together and present them as an offering of God. Let us offer our prayer of dedication. With these gifts, dear God, accept the praise and thanksgiving of our hearts, which rejoice in your goodness and love. Let our gifts point to your presence in the world and further your dream for the world through Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. Amen.
we heard the message of John the Baptist calling us to repentance, to change in our lives, to be new people. We need to hear those words. We need to hear them this season during Lent and often because we know of our own failings. Hear those words, take them to heart. Examine your lives where we can all change and be more aligned with Jesus Christ and his values. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Amen. Amen.